uh, first up we have in our introduction today, Mrs. Mabato Baghana, who was born in Pretoria in South Africa. She's married to a Congolese man. Together they have two daughters. She holds a Bachelor of Science, a BA Honours. She has been involved in pastoral work since 2008 and counselling since 2016. Since 2019, she's been working in the paraclesis model of counselling uh, that she studied through SATS under Dr. Mervyn van der Spee. Even to this day, she's not only one of the lecturers in the undergraduate counselling lecturing team, but is also continuing her studies in Christian counselling through the South African Theological Seminary. She is a pastor in her local church and enjoys using her counseling skills to help people in church and community to declutter so that they can fulfill God's purpose for their lives. She loves contributing to the upliftment of communities through her involvement in the Siapila Youth Service Support, Youth Support Services, as an organization geared towards the empowerment of the youth, women, um, and women in their communities around South Africa. So welcome to you, Mabato, and thank you for being here today. Our, our second guest, uh, Mrs. Idelette Muller, has been involved in a counseling ministry for approximately 15 years, seven of which are focused in trauma counseling. She has been the subject matter expert in the paraclesis counseling model under the leadership of Professor Mervyn van der Spee from 2020 to 2022. Presently, she is completing her MDiv, Idelette is also a trauma counsellor with the survivors of human trafficking and sexual exploitation and often speaks on the topic of human trafficking at selected events. She regularly writes articles on womanhood and marriage for Wedding Hub and Lifestyle magazine. And Idelette has written three blog articles for the SATS website based on her encounters with sexually exploited and marginalised women from a counselling perspective. She has achieved a music degree and an honours degree in educational psychology alongside her counselling studies. She has produced a music CD called The Voice of Freedom, ministering in song on the issues relating to modern day slavery and freedom in Christ. Idelette is married to Andrew and they have three young adult children. Both our interviewees are making meaningful contributions here at SATS in the area of Christian counselling. And I just want to welcome both of you to the interview today, thanking you so much for being present um, with us in this space. So, without further ado, I think it would be important for us, we've come to hear a little bit more about the paraclesis model of counselling. But sometimes it's important for us to understand a little bit more about the man behind the model. And so, Idelet, would you mind sharing with us um, a little bit about Professor Mervyn van der Spee, um, the man, the creation of this model? Um, what, what did he see that prompted him to create this model? Over to you, Idelet. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, Candida. It's such a privilege to be here and um, speaking about something which I'm very passionate about. Um, Dr. Mervyn van Espey was a psychopharmacologist, a counselor, a pastor, a teacher, and he was my mentor for a couple of years. I was so privileged to have um, studied with, you know, under his wings and um, learned about him and about the paraclesis model through him. Um, he was born in 1950 and sadly passed away in the beginning of this year. And he left a tremendous legacy behind. So such, such a rich person that has um, influenced the counseling world uh, tremendously. So the paraclesis model uh, was a dream that he had. In 1993, he gave birth to this model, so to speak. And his principle and his vision was all about equipping people to come alongside the hurt and the broken out in the world in a non-judgmental way and to view them from an integrative perspective rather than just one perspective. And he saw a need for that in the Christian counseling world especially. And so he developed a model which looks at 
the biological, psycho, psychological, social and spiritual development of people, as well as all those influences throughout their lifespan. And um, considering all those factors, he construed this amazing model in order to come alongside those people with more insights and also to help them view themselves in a more integrative manner. Um, his paraclesis model was based on a couple of scriptures that speaks about the Holy Spirit being the parakletos, the one who comes alongside, the one who bears up, who counsels, who comforts. And that is what we would like to do as Christian counselors, isn't it? To come alongside the hurt and broken and to comfort them with the comfort that we ourselves have received from the Holy Spirit. So those scriptures are found in John 14, 16 and 2 Corinthians 1 verse 4. Such, a, such an amazing um, foundation that we can find in scripture. Thank you for that, uh, Idalette. It's lovely to hear a little bit more about the personality and the person behind it. So also it's a credibility when we start to explore who actually came into this as a beginning voice. Um, so Mabato, I hope it's okay for me to engage you on this one, this idea of an integrative model. Um, perhaps you can give us a broad overview of what is the paraclesis model. Thank you, Candida. I think to help us answer your question, it would be good for me to mention what the paraclesis model is, according to Professor Mervyn. And I would like to read out what he says. He says, paraclesis entails helping relationship in which the spirit-filled counselor helps people through theological and psychological to understand and resolve their own problems according to the word within the caring communities of believers under the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit, which facilitates and realizes growth towards wholeness in Christ. When we look at this definition, he says it entails a helping relationship. He's, he mentions a spirit-filled a spirit filled counselor. He, he mentions the use of theological and psychological insights. But the more important thing is that he uses the theological and psychological insights to help for, for the for the counselee to be able to understand and resolve their own problems, which means the counselor doesn't solve any problems, but the counselee discovers what their problem is. And this comes from the insights that also come from the word of God, which means this model is Bible based. Also, he mentions that the, the, the whole process of counseling takes place under the dynamic power of the Holy Spirit, who is the pivotal point of this whole model. And because he is the most important person, he facilitates and he realizes growth towards wholeness, which means that the counselee comes in broken and the Holy Spirit through the, I mean, the, the counsel, the counselor through the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit helps the counselee move from a place of brokenness to wholeness and that's the reason why we know that at the end that definition it says he facilitates that growth so that the person comes to wholeness in christ so in this model we are already seeing that the paraclesis model is bible based it is christ-centered it is Holy Spirit led 
and it is also psychologically sound. And because of that, we know that the Holy Spirit comes alongside the counselor as well as the counselee for him to be able to continue with the process of moving the counselee from a place of brokenness to wholeness. Thank you for that, Mabata. I think that's quite a thorough overview. Um, if it's okay, if I can ask that um, cameras are switched off and just until a little bit later on, um, apart from this, the presenters today, and then we will be able to engage the audience a little bit later. Thanks for that. So I'm listening to what the overview of this model is, Idalette, and I'm hearing about people being able to journey with the Holy Spirit. I'm hearing about problems that we are engaging as counselors, but not to fix it, but to journey alongside that the counselee and the Holy Spirit start to, to work out people's problems. Um, and the, the, the idea of problems is a big one for us as Christian counselors. And I'm wondering if you can perhaps help us understand a little bit more from the paraclesis model perspective, this, the etiology of problems. Um, the causation of problems. How do we look at problems through the paraclesis model of counseling? That's a wonderful question because human existence is so complex. We cannot just find one reason for the problems in our lives. There is an interplay happening all the time since even before birth and throughout our lives. And those aspects have a profound effect on the human mind, on the human um, experience, and of course, spiritual development as well. So that is why we look at biological factors. Those are the medical kind of factors, genetic factors. And um, we cannot discount that it has an influence. Um, psychological factors like emotional development, cognition, which is your thoughts, your thought development, your brain development, um, which all have an effect on behavior. So when we look at behavioral problems, we can't just look at one little aspect of that. We have to look at it within the broad spectrum of what makes up this person. Social factors, like the social family that the person was born into, the community, uh, the effects of others on this person also play into the development of certain issues and problems. The spiritual aspects, faith development, the, the faith of the family, for example, also has an effect on how this person perceives faith issues and God, the worldview of the world and people and themselves, even themselves. And that is why we look at the complete human existence in order to see what went wrong, when it went wrong, possibly, and most importantly, what now. So now we, we suspect that things went wrong, but we are not psychologists and we are not psychiatrists. So what do we do? And this is where the Christian counselor can come in, identify certain issues that have gone wrong that could be, that could be at the bottom of this problem. But that is where we refer our clients for professional help. And it's so wonderful how the Holy Spirit guides and leads us to understand this person from this broad spectrum of factors that come into play. So we don't reduce our clients to just one little aspect of their existence, but we recognize that there are many things we have to consider. These things are also important when we want to work out an intervention plan. Now, as I've said, we are not psychiatrists, so we can't prescribe medicine um, if we suspect there is a mental illness, but we can refer the client and then we can still come alongside them. We can introduce them to the power of the Holy Spirit 
um, not by forcing our views upon them, but to try and understand how they view the world themselves and their problem, and then help them to choose differently, to make better decisions, and to gain insight into all these factors in their own lives. Um, we would like to um, empower our clients in order for them not to think I'm a victim of my circumstances and I can never escape and I can never get out. So that is the vision of the paraclesis model. Um, on this journey towards wholeness, we would like the participation of the client and of the person who has all these problems. They are not their problems, but they have the problems. And it doesn't mean that there's no hope for them. We come alongside and we help them to find meaning despite those problems they experience. Yeah, I'm hearing the, a similarity. I mean, we heard the words last week about encountering the person behind the problem. And, and if I'm understanding you, it's, it's, it's a case of um, journeying alongside the Holy Spirit enabling. There's a lot of collaboration, um, a collaborative um, partnership between the Christian counselor and the medical field, the Christian counselor and the psychological field to refer to professionals when someone actually has an etiology outside of our scope of practice. But within our scope of practice, there's still this journeying alongside. So the biopsychosocial uh, is present and the spiritual, which is enter the Christian counselor, the journey alongside, the partnership with the spirit, the encountering the person behind the problem and allowing the spirit to, to really engage the human, the, the, the reality of who that person is. Um, it's a beautiful model, if, if I'm understanding it correctly from your, your perspective here. Um, I remember Prof Mervyn saying, we are... Um, let me just make sure I get it right now. We are a product of our past, but not a prisoner of our past. I hope I got that right. But I do recall him saying something. That's that encountering of the human um, in the moment that is so profound. Um, thank you for sharing it in the way you did. Um, when we, we speak in biopsychosocial spiritual now, so Mabato, this is an integrative model. I understand that. I, I hear what Idalette is saying. There's an etiology we need to be mindful of to know when to refer, when to engage. Um, and I just would like to know a bit more about these processes that are within the paraclesis space. I've heard the words and, and I've been able to engage with a couple of the courses. Awesome. Uh, it's been such a privilege over the last few months. There's this kaleo, fatismo, dunamo. Um, that the model engages the counsellor in to be able to learn to work with a counsellee. Could you unpack those a little bit for us, maybe explain those three processes a little bit more for us? Would you mind doing that, please? I don't. Thank you. I will do that. Um, the process, as I mentioned earlier, we live in a broken world. And because we live in a broken world, as we remember what Ida Led has, has already mentioned, there are many causes of problems in people's lives. And because there are many problems in people's lives, we need someone who will stand in and come alongside the counselee to be able to be moved from that place of brokenness to a place of wholeness and when we remember the definition according to professor mervyn it's moving to wholeness in christ which means it's not just a general wholeness and for us to be able to move from brokenness to wholeness we need the help of the holy spirit who comes alongside the counselor and in this the initial space, the initial stage is when the counselor builds a helping relationship with the counselee. And that is what we call the Kaleo stage, where the counselor looks at the, uh, I mean, accepts the counselee and respects the counselee 
and looks at the counselee without any judgment at all. Because that, the, 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 the countenance of the counsellor is actually the one that helps the counsellee open up their heart to be able to say, I am willing to buy in or to, con to, to commit to this relationship because the kaleo is invitation into a participation and because of the counselor who has approached the counseling with respect and non-judgmental acceptance then that openness of heart that happens in the counselee actually sparks the manifest presence of the holy spirit where we then see the holy spirit helping the counselor come to a place where she or he would then help the counselee through asking questions, through letting the, the, the counselee in, in what they say, that the counselor will then paraphrase or would summarize. That is where then the counseling skills kick in. And in the counselor listening and being able to help conceptualize the problems for the counselee, then the counselee gets an aha moment, which is the stage called fortismo. Fortismo coming from the word photo, which means light. And it is in this that we get to see the Holy Spirit, then also helping the counselee to realize, oh, if I could give an example now, let's say the counselee comes from a divorced background and now because of the conceptualization of the problem that has happened, the counselee realizes I have been holding for unforgiveness towards my parent. And because of that, the fortismo stage makes the counselee realize I need to change for me to be able to get to wholeness. I need to forgive my parent. And that choice brings the counsel lead to a stage which we call dunamo. Now we get to see the Holy Spirit operating in power in the life of the, 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 the counsel lead. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining the counselee who then remembers that I need to forgive my father and because they have recognized that the light of Jesus has shone in their heart, as Paul also reminds us in 2 Corinthians. Now they get to the process of change. Now this is active change, no longer a recognition that I need to change. But now they obey because the Holy Spirit, the power, the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit propels them to a place of obedience to say, I am now going to forgive my parent. And then that stage shows where the counselee takes responsibility to say, I own up to my problems, but I own up to living out the change that leads me to wholeness, where I am now more like Jesus Christ. So we see a whole process that is led by the Holy Spirit, where he comes alongside the counselor to be able to build or form a helping relationship. And he helps with facilitation because remember here, he is the primary helper who comes alongside the secondary helper who is the counselor in this case. And because of the, the, the kind of questions that the counselor would have, had, would have asked, then the counselee comes to a place of realization and the Holy Spirit through his power helps the counselor to move into actively living out that which was shown to them. So 
if I'm getting this, the responsibility for change is in this final phase, this dunamo phase. And it's actually between the, the client and the Holy Spirit. Um, so we're actually saying, hear me if I just catch me if I'm not getting this, that this is not our opportunity to preach. This is pretty much when we look at this, the, the way this model unfolds, this, what you've just shared, is where we see the difference between being a preacher and being a counselor. This is where we actually are facilitating. We are engaging the Holy Spirit and we facilitating the engagement of the Holy Spirit with the client through this process that you've explained. It's not a preaching, um, condemning or, or anything kind of thing. It's actually very skillful facilitation. Um, there seems to be a, a, a decentering of ourselves from the client's story a little bit, don't, isn't it? Uh, we can't be the hero in their story. It, it, it points directly back to Jesus Christ being their one and all and the spirit being the, the capacity to lean into that. Um, I find that quite profound. The, where the responsibility falls, I think, is really important for us to remember as Christian counselors. Um, in that space. Um, so we, we've had a look at this model. Uh, I know it's we, we've taken a very bird's eye view. I know we haven't got into extreme detail in it really, but um, perhaps it elect, could you just share with us, I know a lot of people that are here today would like to know, well, how does that play out in coursework? So if someone now, okay, that sounds like a model I'm interested in, what does that look like? Um, what does that offer? What, what is that about? Um, can you go through that a little bit with us, please? Yeah, sure. Um, now, in 2001, Prof. Mervyn uh, presented his courses. Um, him and Sats had a wonderful conversation. And so the law just opened the doors for his courses to be presented at Sats. And we have the privilege of still having those. And um, his courses are based, um, obviously, Bible-based and Christ-centered and spirit-led theologically and psychologically sound, which is so important. And um, these courses equip lay and pastoral counselors to come alongside people with integrity, spiritual integrity, but also professional integrity. And as you said, it's not about us as counselors. It's, it is about the client. Um, it's a bit of a shift to what most people have thought counseling might have been in the past. Um, where they had the opportunity to tell the client exactly what was wrong with them and how to change and how to fix themselves. But we don't do that. Um, it's a client-centered approach in all the courses where we look at how, how does the client experience their situation and their um, problems. So what we do present is what we start off with the big five. So these are the foundational courses. And um, we just love them because they challenge every person who does them <laughs> in terms of worldview and how we, uh, how, what counseling would look like in your context. So biblical basis of Christian counseling is, is the mother course um, where we come from in terms of worldview and perspective on what is Christian counseling? What does it look like to come alongside hurting people? And then we move on to theoretical foundations in Christian counseling, which means that we have a look at all sorts of theoretical approaches out there. Um, we have a very rich history when it comes to the developmental aspects of counseling and therapy. And there's a lot of good stuff we can learn from that. Um, not everything is compatible with a Christian worldview, but there are a lot of stuff that are compatible. And we glean from those insights. And some of those insights are just plain logical common sense of the human existence and experience on this earth. So we present some of those and we invite the students to, to keep a, a virtual toolbox alongside them, so to speak, where they can put some valuable skills and knowledge in there, what they gain from different perspectives. 
Excellence in Christian counselling is about the ethics of Christian counselling and this is very important in our courses because we cannot move outside of the scope of our training. And I think that is why there might be so much questionable counsellors out there who don't realise they are doing harm. They've got good intentions, but they do not understand the ethical implications of what they are doing in the counselling room. And we make very sure our students know what those entail. We want them to leave with, with solid foundations, to be able to come alongside ethically and in safe boundaries. Psychopathology and spiritual conflicts is another cause which looks at mental illness. Now, this will not qualify a student to become a psychiatrist. Let me just put it out there. But it gives tremendous helpful insight in understanding mental illness. Now, depression is a good example to look at. And I was one of those who believed that depression was actually a symptom of being crazy. So we don't use the term crazy and we refer to mental illness as a, it, it's got so much uh, biological factors that we cannot overlook. And so we, we treat lightly in this area and we make very sure we don't diagnose people or even diagnose ourselves. I mean, yes, after doing this course, we, we want to go into diagnostic mode and say, I think I'm there's something wrong with me. And then in the end, it's, it's really not that. And we cannot do that at all. So we refrain from diagnostics altogether. We refer. And then, of course, human development. It's such a pleasant course because we look at the whole de developmental journey of a human being through life. And that's especially with the biopsychosocial bio spiritual dimension comes into play, where we look at how this person experienced things from very little, even before birth, and what impact that could have had on their normal physical cognitive and emotional development. And again, this is not so that we can diagnose, but in order for us to come alongside with insight, knowledge, and to be able to refer the client if they so need um, more specialized help. And then of course, we've got wonderful elective courses. These are more um, focused on specific contexts. So we look at relationships, marriage and family counselling, child and adolescent counselling, congregational care and lay counselling, quite an important one, I think, medicine, health and healing, as well as introduction to ageing, death and dying, just coming, along, coming alongside people in different phases of their life journey. Now, a student might do these courses and still feel I want to specialize in a specific area, which they can go and do some more um, focused training in that area. For example, after doing the crisis and trauma counseling, they might want to become specific specialized trauma counselors. So we give them a good foundation and an overview, but it's up to them to go and specialize in a particular field. Introduction to wellness counselling is another one. Domestic violence and abuse counselling. One of my favourites because we do sit um, with society where this is prevalent. And unfortunately, Christian counsellors have got to know how to come alongside survivors and victims who find themselves in these situations. And we are privileged to be able to give a foundation to, to um, students in order to come alongside with compassion and again, insight. The introduction to addictions counseling also is just a foundational course in the skills department. They are required to go and study a little bit further in this um, field as it is very specialized. It's very complicated. 
But um, we believe that we give a good biopsychosocial spiritual foundation. Uh, I've tried to say it very fast at times, and it's very funny when you can't when you can't say it very fast. But this is our approach in all our courses, and we are very proud of our courses. Of course, the counselling skills practicum one and the advanced, um, more internship based skills course where. Um, they apply their counselling skills out in the field. Now, these counselling skills courses are tremendously important and so helpful. It provides the student with a bunch of micro skills that they can apply in their context with, of course, all the foundational worldview and preparation that they have um, received from the other courses. And it teaches them on what it looks like to come alongside a person with particular problems. The right questions to ask without making the client feel like they are at a seventh inquisition or at the police station for that matter. So we keep in mind that coming alongside clients require training. We want our counseling students to be trained, equipped and ready to go further with their studies if they so choose. So this is only the beginning, this is not the end. It opens a whole world to the student um, in terms of counselling. And the counselling world is ever evolving. It's growing. Uh, people are writing books all the time. New contexts um, are discovered in which the counsellor can make a huge difference. So our courses really aim at equipping lay pastoral counselling counsellors to make a difference in the world. Can you still hear me? I'm hearing an echo, so just let me know. Okay, right. Okay, so I'll stop right there for now uh, about our courses. Thank you. Thank you for that, Idalette. Uh, and I would like to direct the audience just if they want the list of what you've just explained. It is obviously all on the website under the higher certificates of Christian counseling, as well as the Bachelor of Theology with a counseling focus. And then obviously SATS also offers the honors in um, Christian counseling. Um, but thank you for that. Uh, there is quite a plethora, a bouquet, I like to call it, of courses and ways to look at the paraclesis model and how to apply it. Um, you mentioned two courses there. I believe the one is brand new and is starting next semester, which is the Advanced Counseling Skills Internship. So we wish you the best for that. I think you will be lecturing that space. So thank you for putting the effort into journeying with our students, actually. Um, Mabato. So you have to share with us, please, what is your favorite? I know you've done all the courses, you're lecturing in this space. Tell us, if you don't mind, what is your favorite course and how have you found it to be useful in your context? I liked a few and I still like a few, but the one that stands above all of them, I actually discovered when I did my internship and as, as I was to do my internship, I was to contract with a supervisor, with an agency. And in my interaction with my supervisor, I then realized there's a, there are lots of challenges and I'm discovering some of the reasons why there are a lot of hurting people in the church environment local churches with good intentions causing harm to people. And I came out of those um, sessions with my supervisor knowing that ethics is very important. It is important even in the local churches. Believers need to move from a place of good intention to a place where they are able to serve and come alongside one another without causing any harm. So ethics is the, is the, is the cause that actually stands above all of them. I realize that as a pastor now in church, interacting with people 
it becomes a bit of a challenge where you need to switch relationships. The congregation members see you as a pastor, but at the same time, when they hear you come alongside them, they're not sure whether you're a counselor or what. And I realized that this is a place where I needed to, to mention to the congregants that I am a helper, not a counselor, because my competence level says I cannot be called a counselor. My scope of practice is below that of a professional counselor. So I realized that sometimes also, even in the church, people will come alongside each other, share problems, and then we get to a cell group meeting. When we get to the cell group meeting, we pray and it's pray. But it's from a place of ignorance that this happens because I will just use Idalet as, as an example. If Idalet was my counselee and she has shared all her problems, and then I go to the cell group meeting and say, you know, I was with Idalet and I really think we need to pray for Idalet. In that case, I have breached Idalet's confidentiality. Even though I wanted the cell group meeting to pray for Idalet. So when we look at the, 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 the ignorance that is in the church of Jesus Christ, as well as in the community, I realize that it is very important that we be informed before we can come alongside people so that we know the parameters, the boundaries that we need to have to be able to protect the, sorry, to be able to protect the counselee. And in this, ethics is one of the most important causes that I feel that the church needs to be taught that the, 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 the believers, remember the definition from Professor Mervyn, that the paraclesis model happens within the believers. And if the local church cannot be relevant in that regard, then it means we will cause a lot of hurt in people. You've said some pretty profound things there, um, Mabato, and some scary ones. And I think uh, yeah, a lot can be said in the space of ethics and ignorance. Uh, people with perfectly good intentions very often don't understand necessarily how dangerous a certain act can be and illegal. We don't always realize the legalities around our ethical um, issues or our ethical misdemeanors if i can put it that way it's it's a it's a big challenge that we're facing in a lot of congregations and i think it goes beyond and outside of counseling i think in the pastoral space too and perhaps ethics and a version of the ethics course is important for not just christian counselors for pastors for anybody engaging in groups talking with children working with young people there are legalities there are laws that we need to be mindful of and to keep the church safe and so the church can reflect God to the world without ending up in court. You know, that's, that's what we would like to see, Christ glorified. So I thank you for bringing that to our attention. Um, and perhaps people might want to engage with you further on what, even more detail on that a bit later. Um, I, I think there's a lot to be said ethically. And I think this is where we can transition to Idalet. Perhaps you can share with us I know some of your courses actually engage this idea of myths. There are a lot of myths in the Christian counseling field, in the religious theological field around how we engage psychologically or how we engage in the counseling space. 
Um, can you work with us a little bit, share some of those myths, maybe bust them up a little bit for us as you do in the courses. <laughs> We'd love to hear just a few, maybe one or two of your favorites that you think it would be important for us as Christian counselors to be more mindful of. Yes, thank you for this. I love um, including a myth buster slide in the presentations the students have to do. We always call it myth busters. And um, it is so important in the field of Christian counseling. And this is now perhaps opening a, a evoking some deeper thought on the side of our listeners today, because um, sometimes these myths occur due to the way we grew up due to what we might have experienced in terms of mental illness or problems that people present and then we make up our minds and we think well this is how it is and we preach that as a gospel now let me let me take it into my situation of counseling where i counsel with um, survivors of human trafficking and sexual exploitation and almost all of them are addicted to drugs so let's take a myth around drug addiction for example which i had as a christian growing up i really thought that people who are addicted to drugs are bad that this is what they want and this is what they can never change. I really thought that until I saw what the story behind absolutely most of these drug addictions actually entail. Um, it's so heartbreaking that it is more about trauma and traumatic experiences and trying to numb pain than it is about being bad and being the bad guy looking for what drug can I use. And this busted the myths that I used to have. And this is why I would like to bust these myths in the courses that um, we present, because we really don't know the full story, do we? And all good intentions, but we make up our minds about certain things. The other myth, is also, um, let's say, domestic violence and abuse, for example. I deal a lot with those survivors. And we often think, but this lady staying in this abusive relationship, there's something mentally wrong with her. She wants it. She wants to be abused. I mean, what a terrible myth to believe, but this is also something I didn't fully understand. and. Um, so many factors played into the myth being created in my own mind. Um, and we do come across this myth that we think these women want to be abused. There's really something wrong with them. And, it, and then only to realize it's so complicated. It's so complicated. Um, there's, there's aspects of fear, intimidation, of being broken down, um, that they cannot even decide for themselves anymore, where um, their abuse is far more than just on a physical level. This is where psychological abuse comes in and where it really breaks down the beauty of a person's spirit, takes away the resilience, takes away hope. And this is where the Holy Spirit comes in. When we counsel a person who is in such a terrible, hopeless situation, to give them back their dignity and to say, but you are still a precious creation in God's eyes. What you've done, what you've gone through, the sin you've committed, that does not reduce you to being a bad person. You are still precious in God's sight. You still have the potential to choose and to change. And that's where we come from, um, busting these myths. And we, we empower that person through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we introduce them to a different kind of empowerment because we introduce them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we give it as as something that they can choose, not, not to be forced down their throats. So I don't know if that makes any sense. And um, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, there's what I appreciate about what you've said is that very often myths, it's not a malicious attempt to be ugly. 
um, as pastoral workers, as people in churches, um, people who are called to love one another. Not if, no, we're not all equipped for every level or every detail of that. Um, and so very often we are responding out of our worldview. We are responding out of our limited knowledge. And so while you are not uh, down on us for this, you're inviting us to a better way of seeing things, to being equipped, to be able to um, function better in a counseling environment, to have a better view of humanity. And so I appreciate that. Um, I feel like I feel like I've been invited into engaging my thinking patterns and still being drawn forward into a better way to see humanity, a better way to see problems, a better way to engage with the care ministry. Um, and then obviously the level of counseling that requires the equipping that you're su suggesting. So I I like the way you've put that for us today, Idele. Thank you for that. Um, and Mabato, perhaps you could share a little bit about how this paraclesis model um, has influenced your pastoral work as, as a, a lay Christian counselor, as a pastor, you've done the higher certificate, you have worked in the theologi other theological uh, courses too. So please, can you share a bit more? How has this played out in your context, the paraclesis model? Before I did the higher certificate, I used to sit with people who had challenges for hours on end. <laughs> and I realized that I didn't know anything about helping people. But having completed the higher certificate, I realized that it actually empowered me as well, as well as equipped me to be able to help people to move from a place of brokenness to wholeness in Christ. And let, we need to remember that wholeness in Christ does not stop there at the end of the session. The paraclesis model, as well as Christian counseling, they form part of the bigger picture of pastoral care, where people need to grow and develop into being more like Christ. They need to move from play, a place of receiving to a place of giving, where their participation changes in that they are able to to, to, to help other people. So with me, I would sit with people. I have this specific example that I'm thinking of now, actually, that this lady brought her 16 year old daughter who had a challenge with sleeping and had a, missed her dad quite a lot. And it came out that when she was with me in the counseling room, that she mentioned that when she came back from school and at that time she was six years old, she got to together with her dad who had picked her up from school. They got to an intersection and when they were at the t intersection, people came and gunned her dad down. And 11 years on, she started wrestling and she's been to 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 various counselors but she started wrestling again she couldn't sleep she had lots of challenges and that's when her mother brought her to me at church and when i said with her the beauty of the paraclesis model in listening to her in asking questions the holy spirit revealed to me that her challenge was actually not the fact that she missed her dad. It's because she went to her mom because the sense that I had at that time was her mom is the one that can help her to come to a place of wholeness. And instead of me telling her that I think your challenge is mom, <laughs> is from mom, not mom, but from mom. <laughs> I asked if she would be happy if I could chat with mom and I still guaranteed confidentiality, but I wanted to clear something else with mom. 
And when I sat with the mom, I asked a question. And the question was, how has your relationship been ever since dad passed on? And she started crying. And in our conversation, I realized that as soon as she heard that her husband had died, she filled the role of her husband. And every time her daughter went to her looking for mom, the daughter found dad because mom started wanting to do everything that dad would have done, but didn't bring out the nurturing side of the mom that the daughter wanted. So in this, the, the end of the story is mom realized that the Holy Spirit had, had revealed that mom needed help in that she needed to let go the dead role of the of the dead role but be the mom but at the same time help the daughter be present for her daughter and no longer being the busy one the beauty with this girl is after she understood because now i'm talk, I'm, I'm now hopping to to other sessions where i've been with this with this girl now when she realized that her challenge was a misunderstanding between mom and her because of roles that have reversed. She forgave her mom, but she grew from that place to now serving in our youth ministry at church, which means that this girl, the paraclesis had helped me to help this girl move from that brokenness that had a confusion because of what was happening in the family. But the Holy Spirit, who knew the bigger picture, revealed and helped mom as well, who today is also healed and is helping other widows to be able to, to live in a different way with their children instead of step into I'm a mom and a dad at the same time. So the paraclesis model has actually shown me the bigger picture where you it supports pastoral care in moving people to being more like Christ and serving after that. So it's a continuation for, for, for people to be able to serve and live out their calling. Thank you for that, Mabato, and thank you for being in pastoral ministry. Thank you for carrying the counseling candle forward um, and letting the paracletos do the work as you have studied and believe is a good model of practice for your Christian counseling journey. Um, you've actually put that in place with your clients so that the Holy Spirit was the one who enlightens the process, who actually engages the client. So it's lovely to hear how it plays out in pastoral care and pastoral ministry. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to thank the two of you for putting yourselves in the hot seat today. It's never an easy task to um, to be asked questions. It's it's to be to have a presentation is different. You can prepare, you can put things on a screen, and we can all benefit from it. But today you allowed us to enter into your courage, your teaching, your your knowledge base, and you shared it so openly um, with such conviction. I just want to say thank you so much to both of you for your courage today. Uh, for your expertise, I thought some questions were actually quite challenging, um, and your expertise is just so profound, and I thank you for loving people, I thank you for loving students, I thank you for loving the ministry of the Lord, I thank you for signing up to help the churches have Christ-like counsellors so that they can fulfill their mandate of reflecting God to the world. So thank you very much for your time today. So profound. So bless you, ladies. Thank you for that. Over to you, Lisa. Thank you, Candida. And I just want to echo your words and thank these two wonderful ladies for their contribution, introducing us to this Paraclesis model, evoking deeper thought on the role of the Holy Spirit in counseling, Thank you for your humility and your profound knowledge that you shared with us and for 
reverting the focus back to the Holy Spirit the whole time. 